Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. These were verses that really bothered me in the past. As a young woman, the idea of submitting to someone in everything, the idea of someone being the head of me, really grated on me. The comparison to Christ, in my initial understanding, gave men authority and power over women, as Christ has authority and power as the head of the church. This sort of headship sounded like control, and being controlled did not sit well with me. I'm not passive or especially submissive by nature. I have opinions and dreams and so many things I want to do. I like to lead, to question, to learn, to be my own person. So these verses, I thought they were trying to take these things away from me, to take away my autonomy. I wondered how I could be the woman it seemed God, or these verses, wanted me to be. Uh, while still being the way that he had created me. I felt I couldn't follow these verses. I couldn't or wouldn't just submit to control. Let someone tell me what to do. Did this mean I would never be a good wife? If this verse felt so wrong, what did that mean about other parts of the Bible? What did that mean about God? These questions run around my mind constantly when looking at this topic. I had seen these verses used in the media and around me to tell women to submit always. I saw how taking it out of its context had opened the door for abuse or to force women into a box of submission. I couldn't blindly follow this thinking. It felt unfair and harmful. Being asked to submit to husbands as we submit to Christ felt like a command that I was struggling to grapple with. Submitting to Christ and his perfection was one thing. To a husband seemed to be another, especially where there did not seem to be, at first glance, a choice in the matter. The idea of God endorsing control within a marriage, or even at all, did not sit right. That was not the God I had grown to know, not the God I loved and had chosen to follow. In Bible studies with Paul, he asked me to go away and make a Bible study on a topic that I wanted to look into more. Because of the discomfort these verses had caused in me, I decided to dig deeper into it. I needed to reconcile the God I know, a God of love who created a passionate, headstrong spirit within me, with this verse that seemed to give men control over me. So I really dug deeper. When I first tried looking at these issues in the Bible, I was overwhelmed and I couldn't wrap my head around all the information. There were a lot of contradicting opinions that confused me. I found a lot of people who were pushing the women should submit narrative and it was a struggle to find the answers to my questions. So I took a step back and narrowed my studying and researching, focusing my attention on one thing at a time. The Holy Spirit worked to show me the truth in these verses and what they're really and why. One of the most important things to of these verses was context. In our quest to understand these verses today, we need to break it down and first look at context. So I'm going to hand it over to Paul to take us through that. Thanks so much, Thanks so much Jackie. Appreciate that. So to understand the context of something, we need to look at the to understand these verses, to understand these passages, we need to look at the context. And so we need to ask the question, this in the first You see something happening there. You see it has a lot of messages of, uh, of unity and harmony because there was a big problem in that church at that time. There was division. There was division in that church. There was disharmony and disunity and, and, and problems. And he was especially addressing those problems. You can see that in, in uh, Ephesus chapter 4, verses 17 to 18. He says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are hardened in their understanding and separated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So Paul here is sharing a, an ideology, uh, you know, um, uh, a separation there with the Jewish understanding and with the understanding of the Gentiles. And Paul is saying because of their fleshly thinking, because they were led by the flesh rather than the spirit, it caused this division, it caused these issues, it caused these problems. And this caused bitterness 
And in fact, he writes, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. So this was happening in God's church. And Paul was especially writing against these things, trying to remedy these things. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. This is what he desired. This is what his aim was. And this is why he's specifically writing these things. He then goes and sets the bar even higher. And he says, be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So here he says, don't just look at this person and this person and, and, and try and meet their level. But he's saying, be imitators of who? Be imitators of God. And live a life of love. What type of love? What's Again, he set the standard there as a sacrifice. Just as Christ sacrificed his life for us, that's the kind of love that we need to have for one another. And then he says something outrageous. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the context of the verses that Jackie just started with, it needs to come from this. Now, I don't want to get too technical. I don't want to go too deep. But he is specifically saying, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ because there was three classes, three groups of, of people that were, that were struggling. They were having issues. It was issues between wives and husbands. There was issues between children and parents. There was issues between slaves and masters. So he's specifically writing towards, towards these uh, divisions, these problems. Now, again, I don't want to go too deep. And I don't know how well you can read that. You can read that better than I can. Uh, so let me look here. But this is a Greek interlinear translation. That means it's a word-for-word -word translation of the Greek. And you can see there in, in verse 21, I'm not going to try and read the Greek. We all know how terrible I am at that. But um, notice what it says. It says, Be submitting yourselves to one another in reverence of Christ. Now notice, be submitting yourselves. This is a constant. This is a continuous verb. That's a constant surrender of one to another. But notice in verse 22, it says, Wives... To the own husbands as to the Lord. So if your translation in, in, uh, in verse 22 has wives submit to your husbands, that word submit is a supplied or added word. Is it wrong? No. But it's out of the context of 21. Does that make sense? So it's not just on its own, it's out of the context of 21. Of wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, let me, let me go a bit deeper. Let me go from a, uh, a um, not a concordance, what's it called? Commentary. So, the wife is to be subject to her husband as to the Lord. This does not mean that she submits to her husband in the same way as, as to the same degree as she does to the Lord, since the husband might ask her to disobey God. Rather, she serves the Lord by having a submissive heart towards her husband and by obeying him as long as it does not require her to, to disobey the Lord. The reason she is called upon to be subject to her husband is that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. As the church is to be subject to Christ, so the wife is to be subject to her husband. This subjection does not mean inferiority. It is clear that the male and female are both created in the image of God, and that in Christ... Where personal worth is concerned, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. However, in the overall scheme of things, God has placed all of us in different positions of authority and submission. Let's go and look at a bit more of the context about actually what was happening at that time. In Ephesus, and you can go there today, uh, and I've been there myself, and I'm sure some of you have as well. You can look and you can see two old broken down pillars, which were the temple of Artemis 
in Ephesus. It was, it was one of the wonders of the world at that time. It was such a big temple. It was such an important temple. And if you've read the book of Acts, there was such a, um, yeah, there was such a kerfuffle. There was such a, 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 a strong um, uh, protectiveness of this temple and of this God. So the temple of Artemis. Artemis is in the Greek and when, when the Romans came, they changed it to the Temple of Diana. So, um, and this goddess was a goddess of fertility. And here you can see an idol. You can see re represented by the many breasts uh, why it was classed as a goddess of fertility. But more than that, what influence this temple had, especially on the Gentiles who were, who were coming from that temple and then heard about Christ from other Christians and were coming to Christ. And so they were bringing with them understandings or misunderstandings or, or confusion from, from this temple. And one of those things was, you know, as part of uh, the temple, part of their worship was they would have temple prostitutes and the, both the male and the female uh, worshippers would go there to uh, join together with these prostitutes. And so it just created this sexual immorality where Paul especially wrote in other books. But more than that, Artemis was older than Apollo. And so this misunderstanding, this, this, um, uh, this, you know, this understanding that Artemis was older than Apollo, it was believed that women were more important or women were born first and thus had authority over men. And this is one of the reasons why Paul wrote to Timothy and said this very obvious thing. It says, For Adam was formed first, and then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. And again, Paul is specifically writing this because there's this understanding, there's misunderstanding, there's confusion regarding you know, what happened in the Garden of Eden. And there was this understanding from the temple of Artemis that, hang on, you know, uh, man was deceived. And they twisted it around and turned it around. And to the Jewish understanding, you say, hang on, this is obvious. This is obvious. Paul doesn't even need to write this. But again, Paul was dealing with specific things. And he was writing to Timothy, who was dealing with specific things, this confusion in the church. So, uh, why... What's my line? No. <laughs> so... Here, here it is. So Paul was especially writing these things. The whole context of what we're looking at today. Paul was especially writing these things to fix the problems of, of the church at that time, of the misunderstandings of that time, and point people to God's ideal. So the question is, what is God's ideal? And let me, let me hand it back to Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body for which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. At first, the thought of a husband being head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, was an uncomfortable thought. As I said, it felt like a control. But when looking deeper, I'm so glad that the example given for this kind of headship is Christ. One of the biggest examples of Christ being the head of the church was when he washed his disciples' feet. So let's just read this story together. If you've got your Bibles or your devices, can you turn with me to John 13? So this is at the Last Supper before Jesus goes to be crucified. He knew his hour was nearly upon him, and so he spent this time exemplifying how he wants his people to be. So from verse 3 to 5. Uh, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And then from 12 to 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. 
Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. We talk about this story a lot at church, and this is because I believe it's such an apt example of Christ's perfect leadership. We can see from verse 3 that he knew exactly who he was. He knew the power and authority he held, yet he did not flaunt it or force people to do as he said, just because he said it. He humbled himself, took on the role of servant, and showed his disciples what true leadership looks like. It is self-sacrificing, servant-like. Christ's headship is always shown through love. He showed leadership through intimate connectedness with his disciples. His headship is not a do as I say, not as I do, commanding kind of leading, but it is demonstrative gentle and loving. He led by example, showing how a leader must lower himself to the role of servant, not control, but guide with love. This humble example of Christ-like headship ties so perfectly in with Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here, the disciples were arguing about who would be given the authority to sit at the right or the left of Jesus in heaven. Jesus again tells them that to be truly great, we must humble ourselves. To be first, we must be last, a slave. Jesus is such a perfect example of leadership because he came, as he says, to serve, to give his entire life for his church. This is the type of headship that Ephesians 5 talks about, self-sacrificing, putting others before yourself. At no point do we see Jesus forcing his church or his people to follow him. Never do we see him coerce or manipulate people using his authority. His ministry was to lead people spiritually, spiritually to truth through and because of his love. So looking at this perfect example of headship in Christ, in the same way what this verse is asking of husbands and what women are being asked to submit to is husbands guiding the wife spiritually towards God and leading them with love. If we look back to the fall in the Garden of Eden, I wonder if this is a natural flow and effect from the original sin. Eve sinning first, so men being given the role of guiding women back to Christ to restore the ideal. However, there is also the specific context of Ephesians 5. In those days, women were not educated as well as men. As Paul mentioned, there was misinformation going around the new churches, and this lack of education would have caused this to spread like wildfire, especially among the women. Therefore, to ensure scriptures were taught correctly and that both men and women would know the truth, it seems to make sense that the more educated husbands would be given the role to gently correct and lead their wives back to the truth. I used to worry that this meant women could not lead their husbands to or support their husbands in knowing God. However, this is not true. Women are still able and very capable of showing Christ and supporting people in knowing or guiding back to Christ. In 1 Peter uh, 3 verses 1 to 2, women are encouraged that the very way they live should, should and can be a testament to Christ to help turn their husbands back to God. So there is a mutual submission, as Ephesians 5 verse 21 makes clear, in asking everyone to submit to each other. And then there are the specifics given by Paul in these verses to help create unity and harmony in marriages and in the church. In the ideal, both men and women, husbands and wives, have an important role to play. In Acts, we are introduced to a married couple, Priscilla and Aquila, two strong Christians who are both seen taking on the role of teaching and correcting together. There is no inequality between them that leaves the woman out of this ministry. It is important to remember that Paul is addressing specific issues in the church, and while these verses are still relevant to us, taking them out of this context is where the confusion comes from. So looking back to Christ's perfect example of headship, headship is not a control. It is an extension of love. The root is love. 
Every action should come from love. God is love, so all his authority comes from love. The headship is the fruit, but the love is the root. If that love is messed up, then the headship will be messed up too. But love is sacrificial, so headship, in its pure sense, should also be sacrificial. Christ does not lord his headship over over us. He teaches sacrificial love and mutual submission. Now I hand it back to Paul to wrap it all up. Jackie mentioned something super important, and in case you missed it, I, I don't want you to miss it. That every action, whether it's leadership, whether it's headship, whether action, it's, a, it's the fruit. But it comes out of something. It comes out of the root. If we don't have love, then the fruit will be messed up. But Christ, all his actions came out of love. So if our teachings are messed up, then our actions will be messed up as well. Our actions will be messed up as well. And so this is, again, why Paul uh, especially is, is writing um, to, to correct these misunderstandings, these mistruths, and set it straight, to set the people back in harmony again. What does this look like? If you have your Bibles, turn with me. I really want to share with you one of the most challenging verses that I've ever read as a man and especially as a husband. And I want to challenge that with you as well. Um, Ephesians 5, verses 25 onwards. It says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does for the church. For we are all members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother to be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Like I said, this is one of the most challenging verses that I've understood or or read or tried to apply to my life. Because it's easy to read, wives, submit to your husband. In fact, we like that. We like that. Gosh, say that again, Paul. Say that again. Wives, submit to your husbands. But then when we read, husbands, love your wives. How much? How much? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What does that mean? Well, What did Christ do for us? Christ willingly went to the cross. He willingly died. For us. For us. And this is the love that God expects of his people. And this is the love that Paul directs husbands to have for their wives. It's much harder to do in person. Let me say it straight. God is calling for husbands, for us, to be willing to die for their wives. Some of you might be saying, Pastor, my wife is killing me already. But we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about this willingness to surrender all first to God and then to submit to one another as in reverence to Christ. Jesus gave that perfect example on the night of Gethsemane, where he says, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And he prayed it three times. But he willingly went. He willingly went to the cross. But it wasn't easy, friends. But he was submitted, he was surrendered to God, and this needs to be our heart as well. So what does it mean? What does it look like? Um, to die 
for, for our family. What does it mean? Many men, we come home after a long day's work and we're tired, we're exhausted. The boss was been rough on us and we come home and before we can decompress, before we can rest, we're given a child, sometimes screaming, and we, we, our loving wife says, it's your turn now. <laughs> and what do, we, what do we do? What do we do? Husbands, love your wives anyway. Love your wives anyway. And this is the example that Christ has given to us. Many men, we are bombarded every day by advertisements and the sexual nature of this world. And as red-blooded men, we have a hunger. But when we go to bed at night and we gently caress our wife's shoulder and she says, Honey, no, no I, had a, I, can't, I can't even do it. I've got a headache. Not tonight, dear. I've got a headache. Husbands, what do you do? Love your wife. <laughs> Love your wife. Love your wife anyway. Take that cold shower and love your wife anyway. And this is it, friends. Is it easy? No. Is it something that you desire and want to do? No. Is it the example that Christ gave to us? Absolutely. And this is why Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. That means that you are no longer alive. That Christ is living in you. This is that transformation. This is that conversion that comes when we put Christ first in our lives. Now, am I perfect? Absolutely not. Just ask my wife. Just ask my wife. But this is it. This is the love that Christ wants for us. Now, let me make it crystal clear that in a good, harmonious relationship, there should be give and take. If one person is only giving and one person is only taking, this is bad. This is wrong. This is not what, uh, what God originally intended. This is not what God really, re originally intended. And so he asks us to be balanced, to submit to one another. To submit to one another. Compromise is only a bad word in theology. In a marriage, it's good. It's necessary to give and take so that you can be one flesh and one mind. So going back to all of us, is God sexist? Absolutely not. He was writing these verses at a specific time to try and create um, unity and harmony where there was division, there was fighting, there was power plays, there was all these different things to try and... Um, yeah, which were causing division in the church and needed to be addressed directly. But can you imagine... Can you imagine church as God originally intended it to be? Where there's no power plays, where there's no anger and bitterness and jealousy, where there is that genuine love for one another, a love that, that spends time with one another, that is interested in one another, that gets to know the names of one another. And I'm not just talking about husbands and wives anymore, I'm talking about in this church. And I'm so thankful to be a part of this church. I know we're not perfect. I know we're still growing. But I've seen what it's like when God's people have submitted their hearts to him, who are putting him first, and who genuinely love and cares for others as well. This is a church that God wants us to be. Jesus said, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. This is how we should be. This is what we've been challenged to do from Christ himself. So I want to encourage you. What does it mean to you to love like Jesus loved? What does it mean to you to submit to one another in reverence to Christ? What does this mean to you? If you say, ah, I don't have this love that Christ had. I don't, I'm still selfish. I'm still proud. 
I want to, I want to encourage you today. Invite him in. Open that heart a bit wider. Surrender that life a bit more. And sing this beautiful song together. I surrender all. Because if we truly want to love like Christ loved, then we need to surrender all to him. First to him, and then to one another. And that's my prayer for each and every one of us. Let's sing together. Thanks, Jackie. You're amazing.